My fascination with Gailey and Lord, starts innocently enough. When a friend posted photos online of this secret spot, that was abandoned and big enough to pull cars into, I had a desire to go there and take pictures of my car. What I discovered the first time there, was that it is a much larger than expected facility with multiple buildings sitting abandoned along with storage tanks, wastewater ponds, old equipment and places where the soil was black. Massive water towers and overgrowth only added to the intrigue I developed for this 234-acre location and the place became a story I wanted to know, and to tell. As time went on, I began watching and searching about the facility, and how such a massive place would be left to rot. My searches would surprise me, finding out that the facility was once a major supplier to the United States government, and how very specific popular items were almost exclusively made here, and how the demise of a whole industry would lead to a closure after decades in business. After researching and investigating the site, I found that I wanted to tell the story, and explain how something like this could come to exist. Gailey and Lord was started in 1886 by William Gailey and Charles Lord, and I could go on about their backgrounds, but my focus has always been on the modern facility that was left abandoned. That story starts in the 1960s. Searching online you can find many old advertisements that are all from Sports Illustrated, with clothing aimed towards the young and stylish professionals. These were black and white advertisements in a quarter page and most of the illustrations were created by Al Moore. One of the many that stood out to me was the US Olympic team at the Tokyo Olympics in 1964 wearing the great giveaway stretch fabric. The men were in blazers made of the material and created by Palm Beach, and the ladies, dress created by White Stag. Now in the Great Depression Gailey and Lord made cotton cloth, and while expensive to make, it became the standard for civilian work wear. During World War II, Gailey and Lord became a supplier of cotton cloth to the United States government. Gailey and Lord, were the kings of khaki.
Over time, Gailey and Lord became a division of Burlington Industries through a buyout of Camerton Mills, and subsequently Gailey and Lord came as part of the deal and continued to create fabrics for the clothing industry. More than a clothing manufacturer, they were a supplier for the clothing industry as a part of Burlington Industries through 1987 when they became their own Gailey and Lord company after a threatened takeover and a leveraged buyout by a Burlington executive for $150 million. Gailey and Lord made fabrics for almost every trendy clothing brand, Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, Guess, L.L. Bean, The Gap, Polo Jean, Land's End, Banana Republic, and even Liz Claiborne was using fabric from Gailey and Lord. Five years later they would become a public company in 1992. In 1993 Corduroy made a comeback in the fashion market and Gailey and Lord capitalized on it. Being the only plant in the United States they had the market to themselves. Their new 14 whale corduroy that was extremely soft, it became the fashion standard for corduroy with a new style ribbing that dominated the market for it, Gailey and Lord subsequently saw over a 25% increase in sales. Adding to the big name brands who used their fabric, Penny, Levi's, Wrangler, Guess, Mossimo, and the Gap would all make clothing from the fabric provided by Gailey and Lord. Over the course of 50 plus years, between those brands, and the military, almost every American has at one point had cloth made by Gailey and Lord touch their skin, stretching further I would think that nearly everyone worldwide in the 1990s and 2000s came into contact with fabric made by Gailey and Lord. There was a sharp decline in the textile industry after the 1990s as new manufacturers from Southeast Asia and other parts of the world started to supply textiles at costs the American industry could not match. In 1994 Gailey and Lord would venture into printed fabrics and expand to work in this venture. This would be the first time Gailey and Lord ventured into non-apparel materials, and the Gailey and Lord home fashion fabrics. A subsidiary of Gailey and Lord would make things like curtains, bedding, and comforters, then further expanding by creating Group 2 that would be making printed fabrics made from cotton and rayon to supply the industry with. Between the first division and Group 2 they would develop another division called Gailey and Lord Prints, making 100% cotton and limited rayon fabrics for men's, women's, and children's wear markets. Gailey and Lord Home Fashion Fabrics, and Group 2 would be centered at Gailey and Lord's specialty plant in Society Hill, South Carolina. Gailey and Lord began to incur operational losses in 1994 with $9.4 million, then in 1995 they would incur over $13 million in operational losses, with over another $14 million in losses closing unprofitable divisions including laying off 450 workers at their specialty plant in Society Hill. 
the losses sustained surprised competitors who stood in awe that a company with the resources of Gailey and Lord could take such a large financial hit. During this time Gailey and Lord would lose over $1.5 million in the failed acquisition of Graniteville Company, which could have doubled Gailey and Lord production by 50%. The following year they would acquire Dimit Industries for $22.right million, therefore acquiring six production facilities in Mexico. This acquisition was to springboard Gailey and Lord into apparel manufacturing of trousers and shorts. Gailey and Lord's tactic, be full service to the American consumer, not just a supplier but manufacturer of clothing to take on the fierce competition of textile mills in Southeast Asia. In 1996 they would invest in new dyeing technologies, despite the expense of new equipment and development of their workforce. The strategy became to be a supplier and manufacturer of high-quality fabrics, by continuing to develop and invest in dyeing and finishing of world-class fabrics and adapt to market changes to stay with the times. Plans included to venture into the Pacific Rim desiring to capture a portion of the market which had an audience of 4.5 billion people, in hopes to keep momentum during a difficult time for the textile industry. However, by 1999 things were deteriorating for Gailey and Lord at a rate that was unsustainable. From the beginning the plant in Society Hill had to have water treatment due to the high about of water waste from the process of dyeing cloth, it's also why it's located on the Great P.D. River, which is a water source for the plant. Some methods of dyeing can require 40 to 50 pounds of water to make one pound of fabric. Of those 40 to 50 pounds of waste water, 98% had to be treated before it could be disposed of. That makes the cost of operations continue to increase, and from 1988 to 1994 there was a large revision to the wastewater treatment plant on site, responsible for treating and processing the waste to a safe level to be released into the Great P.D. River which bordered the Society Hill plants. This was a rather large treatment plant capable of processing 3.5 million gallons of wastewater a day. These extra operational expenses to refine and update the wastewater treatment plant, were costly and enforced by the EPA, adding to operational costs over a decade. In 2002 Gailey and Lord would file for bankruptcy protection, as losses neared $1 billion. The company agreed to continue operations, and produce during the meantime, to keep working through their issues and just two short years later, they would come out a privately owned company, and Arthur Weiner would retire at this time. This led to some very abrupt changes in 2004, with the closing of the weaving plant in Georgia, with a loss of 450 jobs. While rumors of another acquisition were spinning, Gailey and Lord would file for bankruptcy protection again, 
finally resulting in Patriarch Partners buying the company out for $188 million, hoping they could get the company back on track. In 2005 they would be bought out by Swift Gailey Incorporated, who would immediately partner with Lucky Textile Group out of Yuxing City, China. Following that venture there would be a series of lawsuits where the International Trade Commission would investigate into synthetic indigo from China that was under an investigation for anti-dumping regulations. Simple definition of anti-dumping is flooding the market with cheap products produced with the intention of causing a financial gain by undercutting prices of competitors, a regulation applied to American businesses importing from abroad. In 2006, Swift Gailey started downsizing at their facility in Georgia, laying off hundreds of people. Then there's a lawsuit for insider trading during the bankruptcy hearings before it was publicly announced that Gailey and Lord were filing for bankruptcy. Additionally, there seems to have been some issues with the Department of Labor as well. Clearly the point is that Gailey and Lord as early as 1999, were in a downward spiral being brought imminently closer by executive decisions, and an ever increasingly competitive market worldwide for textiles. Now in the mid-2000s things just kept piling on. In 2008 there is a fraud case to add to the weight of things to come with the Securities Exchange Commission. Things for Swift Gailey do not appear to go well, and it seems like every other page of search results turn up legal documents, filings, and official paperwork regarding some not-so-savory things during the late 2000s after the buyout. During that time there are facility closures and plants being sold by Swift Gailey, and even a deal with Denim North America, but these factors only extend the decay that eventually settles on Society Hill. The Brighton plant in Floyd County closed in 2004, the Denim plant in Columbus, Georgia closed in 2006, their plant in Marion, South Carolina shut its doors in 2008, Gastonia, North Carolina, would close in 2009. The business of textile manufacturing is a dirty one as I explained, but when it comes down to it, it's really dirty. Trichloroethylene, a solvent for degreasing metals during the manufacturing process, is a known cancer-causing agent, had been leaked into the soil around the facility and was found in groundwater wells nearby. 
Gailey and Lord entered into a voluntary cleanup contract with the Environmental Protection Agency in 2013. This process included soil remediation, that would take several years to complete. This however never was completed as Gailey and Lord would shut its doors in May of 2016. While closing, the facility did not operate and complete wastewater treatment processes, leaving the wastewater basins at capacity. Then September 14, 2018, Hurricane Florence would dump over 30 inches of rain over the area surrounding Society Hill, causing flooding and a release of wastewater into the Great P.D. River and surrounding areas. In February of 2019, the Environmental Protection Agency would perform a site removal evaluation, and a month later they would issue an emergency response. Then two months later in May 2019 the Environmental Protection Agency issued a time-critical removal action at the Gailey and Lord plant in Society Hill. During this time, they would remove a total of 2,400 containers of abandoned materials, over 100,000 gallons of flammable liquids, neutral, corrosive, and oxidizer waste products, and over 26 tons of flammable materials. 17 separate hazardous materials yard boxes would be filled with solid dyes and removed from the property. In September of 2021, the Gailey and Lord plant in Society Hill was proposed to the national priorities list through a federal register notice. Proposing the site allows the Environmental Protection Agency, State of South Carolina, and the community to access significant information and resources to address the environmental risk associated with the site. In March of 2022 the Environmental Protection Agency voted on the facility, adding it to the national priorities list. The Superfund program established as a federal program by Congress in 1980 investigates and cleans up the most complex, uncontrolled, or abandoned waste sites in the United States, and converts the properties by eliminating or removing the health risks, and contamination of the site. Currently there is not an announced plan for redevelopment of the site, and as of now no changes, or demolition are going on at the site. The site has been mostly stripped of its copper, and steel that was left behind, and the removal of some of it has allowed more contamination to the Great P.D. River nearby. At a point in time where there was a facility manager and a security guard working at the facility after it was closed, most of the equipment and piping have been removed from the site, disturbing a large amount of asbestos, and other pollutants. Nowadays the site is still being salvaged illegally and every week there seems to be less and less of the plant left. This plant at one time was a leader of innovation, bustling with 1500 workers, producing fabrics for every big fashion name you can think of. Now, most of the equipment is gone, the roof lets light through it, walking through throws large amounts of dust into the air, some areas are hard to get to, and some no longer have access, other areas are stripped bare, some places there are puddles of water, warning labels caution you to the mercury contamination, debris litter the offices and hallways of the administrative areas, and if you go at night, there is one lowly overhead light in the parking lot that flickers on from time to time, and then just goes dark. Much like the textile industry across the southern United States, the light just turned off, and everyone left. 